Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast. My name is Stephen, Ma Stephen Moss, and be on behalf of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, I'm excited to welcome you to today's webinar on biomanufacturing to address near-term climate change, near-term goals in climate change. The National Academies provide independent, objective advice to inform policy with evidence to spark progress and innovation. Our programs convene experts to share the latest research to explore new ideas and possible solutions to confront climate change issues facing society. Uh, sorry, confront challenging issues. Align, aligned to that mission, we hosted a uh, workshop in October on successes and challenges in biomanufacturing sponsored by Schmidt Futures. You can find out more information about this workshop and watch the recording at the hyperlink above our live stream today. A proceedings detailing the workshop's discussions was released earlier today and is available uh, at that same website. We encourage you to take a look and uh, we hope that it's helpful to your purposes. We're eager to continue advancing the conversation and actions around key issues in biomanufacturing that were discussed during the workshop. For today, if you'd like to ask questions, please submit them anytime in the Slido box below the video as we'll have a Q&A later on. With that, I'm pleased to be joined by our moderator today, Deepti Tanjori. Deepti is the director of the Advanced Biofuels and Bioproducts Process Development Unit, which is a part of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. It was a pleasure to work with her as a member of our workshop planning committee, and I'm pleased to welcome her here now. Thank you all again for tuning in, and Deepti, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank NASM for organizing uh, this webinar um, on a very important topic to many of us. Most of us in this field are in this field because we care about climate change. So really appreciate uh, the opportunity to participate in this in this uh, webinar. Um, so wishing upon all of you two hours of inter uninterrupted um, in internet. Uh, I'll get started now. I believe there's a slide deck that's coming up. So as Stephen mentioned, today's webinar will focus on biomanufacturing to address near-term climate goals. The potential for biomanufacturing to address certain climate and carbon goals was discussed by several experts during the National Academy's October 20, 2022 workshop. This webinar is also taking place against a backdrop of notable recent developments worldwide that have highlighted this issue, including the US executive order on biotechnology and biomanufacturing, that uh, President Biden signed in September, and a recent report from President Biden's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Further, international activities like the recent COP27 in Egypt included discussions on the bioeconomy as a climate solution. Needless to say, this topic is one meriting additional focus. On the next slide, um, I want to, uh, before I introduce the speakers, I want to take a moment to frame today's conversation. Uh, we feel it is important to explain that in the title of this webinar, near-term refers to items that are immediately actionable, whether it be through policy changes, changes in industry, new avenues of research, or other avenues. Uh, additionally, the goals of today's discussion are to begin to identify biomanufacturing processes or products that might help with these near-term contributions towards climate goals. It is additionally important that we understand why these specific products or processes might be the most beneficial. And lastly, we have encouraged the panelists to think about challenges that are preventing these products or processes from being realized in, in the market right now. Um, with that, I would like to get uh, started. We are joined today by uh, three panelists. And uh, after I provide an introduction, uh, to each of them, we'll hear brief remarks from each, and then we'll transition into discussion and Q&A with uh, all of our panelists. Uh, again, a reminder, if you have a question uh, throughout the session, please feel free to use the Slido app or uh, the link that is provided in the Zoom chat right now. <clears throat> so first up is Corinne Scown. Uh, Corinne uh, is uh, the Vice President and Founder of Lifecycle Economics and Agronomy Division at the Joint Bioenergy Institute. She's also the Deputy Director for Research of the Energy Analysis and Environmental Impacts Division at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, she is also the Head of Sustainability at the Energy and Biosciences Institute and co-founder of Cyclos Materials. Corinne received her PhD and MS in Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Berkeley. 
So now I invite Corin to give her brief remarks. All right, thanks Deepti. Okay, I'll be efficient with screen share here. I brought a few slides just to kind of frame the discussion. Um, so just so you understand my perspective, I am a person who does techno-economic analysis and life cycle assessment. So I am a modeling person who works most frequently with basic scientists and folks who are kind of on the earlier stages of, of the applied technology development. Um, but I have a history of engaging with um, a bunch of different stakeholders in this kind of ecosystem. So biotech startups, largely through AVPDU, uh, farmers, people in organic waste management, um, I am also an impatient person and I want to see stuff get built and I want to see um, things that we develop in the lab uh, kind of move to commercialization. Um, so this was in the read ahead material. This is a, a piece published recently in Trends of Biotechnology and it kind of gives you a sense for what some of the options are if we're trying to do kind of carbon negative biomanufacturing or what people um, term carbon negative biomanufacturing. Uh, sort of different ways that you can take carbon from plants, which are doing what they do really well, taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, um, and then kind of everything in the spectrum from the very low tech to the higher tech options um, for putting that carbon into kind of stable forms. So um, let's see. Uh, it's skipping one of my slides. First. There we go. So I think there's there are people who think very hard about carbon management, and there are people who think hard about um, kind of biomanufacturing broadly and some of the higher tech options. Um, and and those communities don't always necessarily talk to each other. I think that they've been kind of operating in parallel, and there's some and there's some crosstalk. Um, so they're the ones who say like, let's maximize taking carbon out of the air, putting it in stable forms. And this can be like extremely low tech options, right? Some of these things don't even really qualify as like biomanufacturing by the definitions that we're using today. Um, so this could be making bio asphalt, uh, you know, making, making bio oil, pumping it in the ground, um, wood, like mass timber for building materials, um, or in some cases taking a CO2 stream, either capturing it or, um, or converting it biologically. Um, so that would fall in our definition. Then there are the people who think not so much about just how much carbon can we get out of the air and into stable products or under the ground, but this kind of broader view of like, we are moving away from petroleum. We need to develop a whole suite of products to replace those things that we get out of a barrel of oil. And so even if those individual markets are not super big, um, we kind of have to find ways to meet all of that demand. Otherwise, unknown things will happen to markets. Um, and so I think I fall kind of in both of these camps. Um, and there's certainly a lot of um, attention, as I um, highlight here, on aviation fuels being one of those products that even though it's not the largest fuel market, um, it's something that we that we really need to uh, focus on. Um, it, you know, my general perspective, and this is like the slide equivalent of a soapbox, is that there is this kind of valley of death that's a little different than what people talk about for um, companies where there's you know plenty of energy and funding around kind of developing proof of concept like look we can make this new molecule um and then there's this kind of a dip in the resources that you can find to do all of the optimization that you need to do in order to get it to the point where um, investors are really interested in, and and you can start kind of scaling up and commercializing and so um, I've observed that uh, startups are often operating on these like shoestring budgets they really need infrastructure they can take advantage of that's either um, kind of freely available to everybody or cheap to use. Um, and that is kind of in the foundry side of things, you know, end to end, like integrated stream building, testing, learning infrastructure. Um, and then on the modeling side, we have experienced that the tools that we've put out um, sort of for free on the web for people to do like early stage, like process design, do techno-economic modeling so they understand where their cost bottlenecks are. Like they really appreciate if you make that stuff available for free for people who don't have like really deep, deep expertise in that area, but they still need to kind of get these, these numbers. Um, and then there's got to be more scale up support. So I've, I've certainly heard from people that we don't have enough toll manufacturers here in the US. Um, there needs to be more support for um, going from two to 10,000 liters. Um, and of course, we need policy support for biomaterials, not just fuels. There's a lot of incentives to make low carbon fuels, 
but these biomaterials that need to fill that gap that's going to be left as we transition off of petroleum, there's, there's not as much policy support for that. Um, so this is what we're doing in my group. This is just a like plug. We have this bio C to G tool. And um, and we've experienced that like startups will use it. Um, it's also really interesting that investors are looking for tools that they can do due diligence on. Um, and and so, uh, you know, I think if we could put that stuff out there, it just kind of reduces the friction. Everybody feels like they're operating with more information. And it's ideal if the startups are using the same kinds of tools to figure out their costs as the investors who are doing due diligence on those startups, then everybody has the same information and they can move forward. Um, you know, my last point is just that we've got to identify the low hanging fruit. So I think like we just need to start building stuff. These are some examples of places um, kind of ranging from high tech to low tech um, where we can start making molecules that are of interest and getting carbon um, into into the ground or into stable products. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Corinne. So I will now uh, move to the next panelists. Uh, Jeff Levinsey, our next speaker, is uh, CEO, founder and CEO of Levinsey Bioenergy Bioengineering LLC, where he serves as an advisor to several biotechnology and chemical companies. Previously, he was senior advisor to the CEO Bioengineering and Technologies at Genomatica and has decades of industrial metabolic engineering, fermentation process development, and process scale-up experience at several companies. Um, I do want to uh, quickly mention a couple of uh, publications that Jeff has actually made um, in this field, which are very, very important. Um, we can leave those links in the chat later, but I do encourage you to look up Jeff's uh, publications as well. Um, Jeff has a PhD in chemical engineering from Purdue University. So Jeff, uh, please take it over here. Okay, thanks very much, Deep D. Can you hear me all right? Okay, good. So good afternoon, everyone, uh, at least afternoon for me, good morning for others, and thanks to uh, Stephen and NASEM for inviting me to participate as a panel member. Biomanufacturing of sustainable products has been the focus of my long career in industrial biotechnology, so I have a keen interest in this event and in President Biden's recent executive order on advancing biotechnology and biomanufacturing. A couple of disclosures before proceeding. I'll mention uh, several companies engaged in biomanufacturing, some of which I work for and currently advise. I'm not a carbon accountant, but I did some homework to prepare for this event. I also reached out to colleagues from industry and academe with relevant expertise for their inputs. Many responded in detail, including six National Academy of Engineering members. I'll share some of their views with you. According to US EPA, net US greenhouse gas emissions in 2021 were 5.6 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. These are dominated by fossil fuel combustion, 73%, with major emitting sectors being transportation, 29%, electric power, 25%, industry 23% and agriculture 10%. The president's national climate task force in 2021 set the following goals. Reduce US greenhouse gas emissions to half of 2005 levels by 2030. Reach 100% carbon pollution free electricity by 2035. That'll require huge reductions in emissions through renewable power and huge increases in sequestration for any remaining fossil-based power. Third, achieve a net zero emissions economy by 2050. This will require dramatic decreases in emissions and increases in sequestration. If we take these goals seriously, and I think we should, then it will take an integrated approach and a lot of investment across all sources of energy, materials, and chemicals to succeed. This is reflected in the executive order. Turning to biotechnology and biomanufacturing, how have these already contributed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions? I couldn't find any comprehensive measure of that. Hopefully it's out there somewhere and one of you can point me to it. Otherwise, and this is my first point, we must know the current bio impact on emissions to effectively grow that impact going forward. For example, one of my industry colleagues estimates that industrial enzymes reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by half a gigaton per year. One specific example, enzymes enable clothes to be effectively cleaned in cold water. 
yet only half of Americans washing cold water. My second point, and I only have two points in my remarks, is that any discussion of bioimpact on greenhouse gas emissions depends fundamentally on the economic competitiveness and abundant, abundance of the feedstocks, whether they be for energy, chemical, material, or other uses. Biomanufacturing feedstocks include mainly cultivated biomass in its various crude, refined, derivative, and waste forms. If I could snap my fingers and change one and only one thing, it would be to give a clear, sustained economic competitive advantage to biofeedstocks over fossil feedstocks. That would transform the playing field immediately and accelerate the growth of more sustainable bio-based processes and products. Unfortunately, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't quite have that today. We thought we were going to have it 10 to 15 years ago when oil was over $100 a barrel and projections were for $200 a barrel and a carbon tax. Today's oil price is $77 a barrel. That makes it a tough go for bio-based fuels, materials, and chemicals. Even so, there have been some successes and proof points. In 20 years, from 2001 to 2020, U.S. fuel ethanol production increased tenfold. As a result, U.S. gasoline contains nominally 10% ethanol. U.S. ethanol emits about half of the CO2 equivalents of petrofuel. In their 2021 sustainability report, POET, a U.S. company and the world's largest ethanol producer, mapped out a path to carbon negative fuel ethanol made from corn. The biggest improvements are forecasted to come from carbon negative agriculture and sequestration of the byproduct fermentation CO2. Brazil's transportation fuel is already 25% ethanol. Let's do that too. By the way, another US corn processor, ADM, has already sequestered millions of tons of CO2 at its Decatur, Illinois site. Poet isn't the only US manufacturing company aiming to mitigate emissions. Jivo is about to build their first plant called Net Zero One in South Dakota to produce fuel ethanol and derivative jet fuel with net zero emissions. Let's do more of that. Jivo is also an example of developing routes to chemicals derived from ethanol. Ethanol is the cheapest bio-based chemical we have, so let's make the most of it. Cellulosic ethanol has not lived up to expectations so far in the US, but it is delivering in Brazil, where its largest ethanol producer, Raisin, already has four operating plants with five more to be added by 2027. In my opinion, cellulosic ethanol can still succeed in the U.S. by a more integrated approach that solves the critical issues in feedstock supply, pretreatment costs, and co-product values. By more integrated, I mean with agriculture, with biology, and with downstream markets. The U.S. startup company Terragia is an example of one that I believe has the right strategy. US-based Lanzatech has three commercial plants in China, converting waste gases to ethanol and derivative products. They've also started a municipal waste conversion facility in Japan. Further on energy, I wonder why the US doesn't make greater use of combusted biomass. It's already providing 12% of electricity in the UK with a lot of that biomass imported from the US. Or what about renewable biogas produced by anaerobic digestion of organic wastes, such as manure and municipal waste? Germany has 17 times more anaerobic digesters per capita than the U.S. The American Biogas Council estimates U.S. production could be increased by seven and a half fold in the near term. Just a couple of proof points now from the materials sector. Polylactic acid, or PLA polymer, was first mass-produced by NatureWorks, a U.S.-based JV between Cargill and PTT. It displaces petro-derived plastics, and it's biodegradable. Now PLA is a billion-dollar market growing at a double-digit annual rate. 1,4-butane dial is a large-volume polymer building block for a variety of tough plastics, and until recently was produced exclusively from oil and coal feedstocks. Genomatica developed a bio-based alternative that was first commercialized by Novamont, its licensee in Italy. Now a second world-scale plant is being built in the U.S. by partners Cargill and Helm. 
product from this plant will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by up to 93% compared with the fossil derived chemical. Genomatica has also advanced two projects to demonstration phase for bio-based nylon intermediate chemicals. One last proof point, this from the agricultural sector. Synthetic ammonia use is a, as a fertilizer is recognized by EPA as a major greenhouse gas emitter. Pivot Bio's proven product, which consists of nitrogen fixing microbes, reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 98% compared with synthetic ammonia. In closing, here are a few headline comments from my colleagues. First, focus more on advancing what is currently at hand rather than searching for new and exciting ideas. Time is short. Secondly, first generation ethanol will be the flywheel for bringing other bioproducts into the market with significant environmental benefits. Thirdly, low carbon intensity bioproducts need to be economically valued and available to consumers. Give consumers a choice. Develop and exploit cheaper electrons via green hydrogen to, produce, to improve biomanufacturing economics. And lastly, it will take trillions of dollars of investments to achieve carbon neutrality. My final uh, comment, uh, the Schmidt Futures April 2022 report is recommended reading. Title is the US Bioeconomy, charting a course for a resilient and competitive future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. I always learn something when I speak to Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> so now moving on to our uh, third panelist, uh, Sarah Richardson. Sarah is the CEO of Microbiar, a startup venture dedicated to domesticating novel bacteria for biomanufacturing. Uh, I must say, many of you are aware of this, but this in itself is a, is a very brave venture to domesticate novel bacteria. It's uh, quite inspiring. Sarah's primary exp expertise is in industrial biotechnology with uh, specialties in microbiology and computer science. She holds a PhD from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in human genetics and molecular biology. Um, I think of Sarah as the micro whisperer, I guess. So uh, handing it over to Sarah now. Well, good morning if you're on my time zone and good afternoon if you don't have the luck to be in my time zone. I have the benefit of speaking last among my esteemed panelists, so I have the unfair advantage of being able to respond to or build on their ideas. And forgive me for my use of slang, but I am, like Corinne, impatient, but also I'm shook. I'm shook. We all are here, as Deepji said, because we want to have an impact but I'm not feeling the impact. I'm not feeling progression towards the impact and I'm not feeling, I'm not feeling the inertia of it, you know, just ongoing pressure of progress. I'm not feeling it, I'm not seeing it. I think as Jeff pointed out that it's difficult to find concrete and publicly available, easily accessible numbers on the impact we've had so far is a really bad sign that if we were truly succeeding and building up on competition and replacement of petroleum over time, over the time we've put into it, people would be shouting those numbers from the rooftops. It's very difficult. I've tried for a long time to figure out and see exactly, say the volume produced by petroleum versus the volume produced by bioprocesses for pick a chemical. It's not easy to find. That is depressing to me. It is just not a good way for us to rally support for a process that so far has taken 20 plus years since we first started saying we're going to use microorganisms to ferment biomass and displace petroleum and where we are today. I'm shook. So somebody mentioned enzymes. I think it was Jeff that mentioned enzymes as a replacement for detergents. This was an awesome opportunity to use enzymes as a publicity tool for biomanufacturing. But a lot of technical people don't realize what's going on. And as he pointed out, 
the people using them don't realize the best way to use them. Uh, it's not a conversation people were eager to open because it leads directly to genetically modified organisms. We haven't even brought the public in on our side about what is necessary to do to supplant petroleum. If we're still dealing with a big public concern and a regulatory concern that follows from public voice about the dangers of GMO organism that leads with dangers as opposed to leads with rewards and then a risk assessment and balance. We've had a long time to identify the low hanging fruit that would enable us to build up this momentum. We spent a long time going for non-jet fuels with disastrous consequences for the external confidence and the internal confidence in the field of biomanufacturing. Renewable power is a much better way to decarbonize energy. We know that now it's doing great at it, but we spent a long time saying that biomanufacturing was going to make energy for us. I think jet fuel is a much better application, but still it's going to be a steep, a steep path. And so one of the most actionable items I have combining all of those complaints is to take a serious look at what's happened so far and ask ourselves, as opposed to what Jeff said, advancing what is at hand, did we do it right? Have we built the right history? Petroleum basically came to take over everything in about 50 years. It wasn't easy. It required massive investment, but that investment was really spurred by a sense of national security needs that petroleum was necessary to protect the United States. And to switch from coal to petroleum really drove the infrastructure building that allows us to subsidize petroleum and then take 3% of that petroleum and make chemicals. And because that subsidy, we made more chemicals from petroleum than we used to make from biomass. Now we have to reinvent that. So the question of, are we reinventing that based on the right technologies is super duper critical. We have to stop for a minute, just a minute and take a look at what we've invested in and ask ourselves seriously, was that the right thing to invest in? Is it actually giving us that return on investment? We've had about half the time petroleum took to overtake uh, biology. We spent about half that time using a certain technology stack without given the benefit of that subsidy or investment, which we definitely need. But we now at this halfway point need to say, are we using the right feedstocks? The answer is no. Are we using the right technology? And the answer, again, I believe is no. How do we assess the time scales that we're actually facing? Do we have enough time for industrial or venture capital to be driving these innovations? Venture capital wants to see a turnaround like that. That is not necessarily a time scale that is easy to do biomanufacturing in right now with the investment from federal sources from, it, they just, it doesn't work. If you're gonna tell someone it's going to take 15 years, like for one three PDO to come online, 15 plus years, your venture capital is not up for it. Some of your industrial capital is not up for it. We have to seriously ask ourselves if we're doing, the, doing it the right way. And I know that's ironic coming from someone who has started a, a company with VC money, but this is a serious question we have to ask. Is this the right route to bring these technologies online? And basing them on the right technologies, unfortunately, there's a feedback loop between medicine and industrial biotechnology, where in medicine, the same technology reaps terrific rewards, but they have infinite margins. And um, you can make really small chemicals that have a massive impact on people surviving cancer. And so that keeps working. But when you say, oh, that tech works, we're just going to bring it to industrial chemicals, it falls down because of margins, because of feedstock costs. So in summary, I'm shook. And the only thing I can think of to do right now at this critical juncture where we really, we don't have much time is to make sure we're not doubling down on something that's going to assure that we don't bring this to success. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, really appreciate those comments. Um, so we thank you for, I mean, we do not have time in the real world, but we do have time today. Thank you for uh, those uh, very important but brief comments. Really appreciate that the panel st uh, stuck to time here. So we have half an hour now uh, to uh, answer questions from the audience. So again, reminder, please use Slido and ask questions. At this time, I don't see very many questions here. So I'm going to start uh, with my question. 
so Jeff, you mentioned um, giving consumers choice. Uh, this is a topic that I care a lot about, uh, primarily about uh, how much people think about biotech in general. And Sarah touched upon this a little bit. To just to give you an idea, when uh, President Biden signed the uh, executive order, uh, many people in our communities were very excited about it. Um, if you look at the YouTube videos, there are a few thousand views on that um, uh, event. But at about the same time, Apple conducted an event, start, opened a new iPhone, you know, launched a new iPhone or something, and there are hundreds of thousands of views there, and people, everyone I know, were very excited about. I just feel we are not reaching to the consumers well enough. And there are a few companies who've done that very well. Uh, maybe Impossible Foods is one such company that transcended the GMO issue. But in general, how much are biotech companies thinking about consumers and how much are we doing in making sure there is a pull from the market? So the, you know, the governments and, and all the other stakeholders are actually investing the trillions of dollars that are needed. Are we doing enough there is my question. No, Jeff and other uh, panelists as well. Yeah, so I'll I'll respond briefly. Um, so your the short version of your question: Are we doing enough? No, not. Um, and by comparison, um, you know, if you if you look at um, appliances, if you go to buy an appliance, you know, it's labeled with the energy consumption by that appliance. Um, when you go to buy food, you get a label with a comprehensive description of what's in that food. Um, and if you're sensitive to GMO content, um, you have a choice. You can buy food that's you know, free of any GMOs. Uh, but if I look at carbon intensity, um, you know, how do I, and I'm a consumer who cares about that, or maybe I don't care, but, but um, um, you still want to inform how do I find out, how do I compare products according to their uh, impact uh, uh, on greenhouse gas emissions? So uh, certainly do need to do more. I know companies who are developing bioproducts are uh, increasingly going to um, consumer product companies who are under some pressure and working with consumer product companies directly to develop uh, more environmentally friendly products. Yeah, I, I can add to that. Um, I, you know, one of the things that we we joke about sometimes is like, you know, when you're introducing a new product and it and it costs extra to kind of get it out into the market, you know, you don't start with like the dirt cheap commodity. <laughs> so don't make, you know, not that it's dirt cheap, but don't make your Model 3 first, make the Roadster, right? You have to start with something where you can operate on higher margins. And ideally, that's like a performance advantaged bioproduct where like you can differentiate it. It's not necessarily a drop in replacement because then the really the only kind of selling point that you have is the bio content, the, the greenhouse gas footprint. Um the flip side of that is that it's that much harder to get something that's not a drop in replacement out into the market, you know, depending on what kind sort of where you're introducing it, there may be regulatory hurdles to getting it approved. You may need to do extra like scale up early so that you can do extra testing to make sure that it meets all the specifications for the product that you want to integrate it into. And so uh, I think this is it's a really challenging spot to be in. And I'm not sure sort of which approach is right or if we have to do both, um, but that can be really challenging. I mean, to um, to Jeff's point, like there's certainly more um, labeling going on in, in Europe, for example. I mean, the, the US hasn't required uh, that kind of like life cycle greenhouse gas footprint labeling. A lot of these biomanufacturing companies commission the reports anyway, and they have that data, but they might not necessarily like put it on the packaging or prominently feature it in a place where like consumers could actually compare um, across different options that they have. So that's something where, you know, I don't, I think that the data exists and and they those analyses have to be kind of ISO compliant. Like it wouldn't take that much more 
to get people to kind of standardize and actually provide that information across different products in a way that would allow consumers to access the information and make choices based on it. Thank you, Jeff. Corinne. Sarah, do you have anything you want to add here? I guess you already remarked on it. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I'll now move on to questions from the audience. And the most liked question from Hal Alper is when people think of traditional refinery versus biorefinery, this is typically a chemistry versus biology divide. The true solution may merge biology and chemistry. Why is this not fully considered? Sarah, I have thoughts on that. Yeah. That uh, one of the tropes of biomanufacturing has always been a one pot solution. You put the feedstock in with one organism, that organism directly produces the target molecule. It's uh, That's kind of falling apart lately, but it has been the overwhelming controlling drive of our bioengineering. And uh, some people are switching that to, okay, we're going to need a consortia, but that is really difficult for large scale industry to sort of adopt because it's not necessarily consistent or robust. And we can't right now, genetic engineering for consortia is in its infant stages. So the proper answer is for organisms, biomanufacturing to focus on what it does well. And that might be precursors to existing chemical processes. What we want to do with petroleum is not invent a totally new way to get at the same molecules. We need to leverage the steel that's already been put in the ground, the processes and the downstream separations that have already been proven. We just need to interrupt it at some point with possibly precursors, with uh, slightly novel things that require only the use of a different catalyst, like as much conservation, reduce, reuse, recycle, as much of that as we can do as possible. And yes, that is going to involve a deep merger of chemistry and biology in a way that if you just think of it as industrial biotech might not come to mind. And as a last note on that, the most successful fermentation companies in the country are chemical companies. So as soon as synthetic biology or biomanufacturing goes big, it's chemistry. Now they're not great at maintaining the bio attitude towards those things, but still. 100% agree. <laughs> That's I, I mean, the, there are examples of this, right? Like alcohol to jet. There, there are examples where you bring chemistry and biology together and let them each do what they do best. Um, but, uh, you know, I think sometimes the discussions that we have are, are separate. I mean, this is a biomanufacturing discussion today, not a biomanufacturing and chemistry discussion, but we, we get to talk about both. Um, sometimes the funding sources are separate where they want, you know, one, one funder may just based on its mandate, be very focused on biology or very focused on chemistry. And so it takes um, some extra effort to make sure that you're getting the right people together to develop the early stage tech. And then, you know, ideally that feeds all the way through to, to commercialization. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would just add to that. I think, um, it uh, answering or addressing Hal's question, why? I think there are educational uh, issues that contribute to that. Um, even today, I would say there are um, very few engineers who are cross-trained, effectively cross-trained in biology and process engineering. It's um, And certainly they're in short supply uh as far as the companies who are looking for that uh, blended skill set and related to that um i would say is um government funding of research so so my recollection is nih funding amounts to something like 50 billion dollars a year and uh funding for for medically related research and funding for you know this kind of stuff um, making uh, things um, by uh, fermentation and hybrid um, uh, processes in, involving chemistry, the funding level is relatively low. And so um, you're a professor, Hal. I mean, you're kind of forced to go where the money is. And um, I'm seeing increasingly engineers who, who are uh, fluent in biology are doing their research, their academic research, in um, in medical applications, because that's where the money is. Yeah, I, 
one thing that I've uh, had a difficulty with is to actually um, combine climate change with human health, right? I mean, if there was a more strong robust case we can make there, then I think those dollars might flow in the direction they should. <laughs> um, well, you've so heard me say that the only thing that kills senators is cancer or terrorism. And so the NIH and the Department of Defense will never run out of money. But the lack of industrial chemicals to change carbon, not killing anybody who matters. So yeah, being able to, I don't think you can actually do that. If we don't consider biomanufacturing a matter of national security, that funding is just going to stay a trickle. Yep, absolutely. Um, so I move to the next question from Brian Boomer. Uh, imagine suddenly petrol was more expensive. It's not hard to imagine. What are the next set of systematic barriers to the broad industry? Scaling facilities? What are the sectors that are closest to having significant impacts on emissions if those barriers drop? Yeah. So um, the, the first one that comes to mind is, is liquid fuels and um, I mean, we saw it 10, 15 years ago uh, when um, it appeared that uh, biofeedstocks were cost advantage and there was um, rapid and extensive investment in um, increasing uh, uh, biofuel, especially ethanol production in the US. So I would, I would expect if, if we saw that again, that uh, biofuels would go from being, you know, something you run away from as an investor to something that people would flock to. And um, provided the, the government will allow, at least allow, or better yet, even promote um, the increase use of biofuels in this country, I would expect that to see another rapid ramp up. Yeah, uh, I think that the liquid fuels thing is absolutely right. And it's just a, it's a question of how sustained do people think, you know, if this happens, right, there's always the question of like, is it a spike and it's going to come back down? Because it's going to take a while, especially with fuels to get the regulatory approval, if this isn't a sort of drop in replacement. Um, to to get those blends approved, and so you you really need people to expect that the price is going to go high and stay high long enough that you can um, get those blends to market and build the facilities to make them. But obviously, fuels are the largest chunk. Um, on the chemical side, it, look, ethylene is the um, one of our most greenhouse gas intensive chemicals, and it's very high volume. So if you're talking about like where to make the greatest impact, aside from fuels, it would it would be finding ways to, you know, either develop replacements for polymers that rely on ethylene, um, uh, you know, or sort of otherwise reduce the emissions from that sector. Any comments from you, Sarah? We don't really know what that systematic barrier is because we haven't really gotten to the point of getting past it. I think um, I think the next set of um, the probably the one and I'm biased here. It's about feedstocks. I'm biased because most bacteria don't like sugar. They don't take glucose, <laughs> but everything rots. So bacteria are eating stuff. Also, when it rots, it does contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. So a systematic barrier potentially to biomanufacturing is a bias towards or dependence on sugar, which can be a competition to food, but also there's not going to be enough sugar to do all of it. We have got to be able to leverage other sources of biomass that don't have to be refined into sugar. So often people say biomass, they mean sugar. There's not going to be enough to do all the things we need to do. And we really need to put investment into non-canonical feedstocks. And I don't just mean methane. I don't just mean carbon dioxide. I mean that the lawn clippings, I mean, compost. We've got to figure out a way to do that without investing all of the energy and costs that sugar is bringing. 
Thank you. So there's one comment here on the Zoom uh, uh, panel here from Valerie Reed, director of Beto at DOE. Uh, for biomass feedstocks, cost alone is not a driver. NGOs can be quite negative on biomass from a sustainability perspective. So I'll move on to the next question now. A uh, question for each of the panelists. If the US government was willing to commit, willing to commit very large amounts of resources towards one particular area of biomanufacturing, where would you put that focus and why? I just said feedstocks in situ manufacture. So not having to move the biomass feedstocks around, biomass is not gonna be easy to put in pipes to shunt around the country like petroleum is. We're gonna to need to figure out ways to produce it where the, produce the chemicals and do the biomanufacturing and do the bio remediation or whatever we're doing where the biomass is sitting. That, that, that would be a really important thing that ties into which biomass can we use. Is it gonna be at waste processing plants and maybe turning it not just into anaerobic digestion that generates methane that we make energy from? Can we do other things from that carbon that we're breaking down? right there? Is it where the silage is being produced and all the agricultural residues are just being left on the on the fields? Can we just rake that up and do fermentation on that right there? So having options besides transportation of biomass or the refinement of biomass, I would throw a lot at figuring out how we can best leverage biomass without aping the petroleum pipeline. Yeah, I, I building on Sarah's comments, you know, I would go back to this question of what feedstocks do we have now, right? Like scaling up like perennial grasses is, is wonderful and it can do all kinds of things for soil carbon restoration, but that is a, a longer term proposition because you have to have the market there and you have to get farmers to start investing in it. And it takes a while before you even have the yields, right? So that that's going to take a while to ramp up if you're going to do that like these waste feedstocks where there's, you could literally are doing harm by not managing them better. To me, feels like the low hanging fruit that you start with. And so there's things like manure. There's clearly some low hanging fruit parts of the country where we have excess manure. Maybe it's getting applied to land, but it's, but it's more nutrients than that land needs, right? So go after those places. If you can co like if you can co-digest that with wastewater or somehow like merge the, the biorefinery with additional anaerobic digestion and convert that biogas or convert that carbon to things other than just, you know, heat, electricity, or renewable natural gas. Not to say that renewable natural gas is bad. I mean, we're all still using gas. If you can replace that with something that's not fossil based, like that's that's still a good thing. And that's definitely happening in California. The other place where I think there's going to be a lot of feedstock available and we have to be strategic is in um, like forest thinning operations. There's like a 10-year plan to mitigate wildfire risk. That one's going to be tricky because you kind of manage some land and that's done and then you move on. And so your biomass, like where it's available, is going to move around. You're not going to have like a bunch of biomass available in the same place for like a 30-year lifetime of a facility. Um, so we'd have to figure out where that's going to be accessible and you can justify building a facility. And in some of those cases, it may be that a smaller scale facility makes sense. As a TEA person, I'm always like, economies of scale, build it really big. And then you see what's actually happening in the market and people are willing to build much smaller facilities, in some cases like mobile <laughs> operations, um, because that makes it maybe easier to procure the feedstock that you need, or, you know, for whatever reason, that seems to be working better in some cases. Um, but that's, I would start from the feedstock and figure out what technologies do we have, or can we develop to process those? Those are, those are all great comments. And I have almost nothing else to say other than I like the, um, President's National Climate Task Force goals. And so my approach would be, let's look at the goals and then let's figure out where to invest the money where we can get the biggest bang for the buck to achieve those goals. Excellent, thank you. Um, so the next question we have from Luis Casco Pereira at IFF. Yeah. The renewable fuel standard has been very successful in establishing ethanol in the US. How about we extend its mandate to include the key building block chemicals of our economy made from a renewable route? So I'll start. My answer is yes. 
<laughs> Let's do that. That's that's one of those questions. It's really not a question. It's a it's a suggestion, and it's a good suggestion. Yes, being a national lab scientist, I don't make policy recommendations. So I can sound sounds reasonable. I you know I we like carbon mitigation is worthwhile regardless of what end product you are making. Uh, Mandate's good, but make sure it's tied to reflection, to milestones. And if we're just not getting there, we need to make sure that we're mandating the right things. If this is the wrong thing to mandate, we need to make sure that we are actually enforcing something that is feasible. Thank you. The next question is from Meron Tespe. Um, which part of the biomanufacturing supply chain should we be tackling first and uh, most near term? Sarah, I'm guessing you'll say feedstocks. I said it. I said it a couple of times. That hasn't changed. Anything else ditto. to add? Yeah, yeah, ditto. But I, you know, when when you ask these questions, what should we be tackling first? So it's I don't think there's in any way you look at this, that there's like one thing that you should focus on. If you should focus on anything, uh, aside when I, from what I just said about, you know, understanding what'll get you the biggest bang for the buck, it's take an integrated approach, visualize where you're trying to get to, and then um, address all of the pieces that are necessary to get there. It's not gonna be, oh, if I just do this one thing, then everything else is going to be fine. You really, you know, we're talking about um, complex systems, and and so you really need to take a holistic approach. Yeah, I mean, the conversion technology itself, in some cases, does still need to be improved. But I think that combined with the feedstock, which is really the prerequisite to doing anything. Um, that's that's where you got to focus your your efforts. So there is no first thing. It's systems level thinking. That's the first thing we need to do. Yeah. Um, next question is from Jay Fitzgerald at the DOE. Argon estimated that corn ethanol produced. Oops, excuse me. Argon estimated that corn ethanol produced a cumulative reduction of five hundred million tons of carbon dioxide from two thousand five to two thousand nineteen. That is more than the impact from all the electric cars to date, and yet we don't hear about those impacts. Why do you think that is? Well, having just gone through the, the process of preparing this report on, um, on life cycle assessment methods applied to transportation fuels, the National Academies report, which shall go read. <laughs> um, you know, I can say that in, even in the you know academic community, there's there's skepticism about corn ethanol and and skepticism about about the numbers. I think uncertainty around indirect land use change impacts, um, soil carbon impacts, even N two O emissions uh, drives you know a lot of people to to just worry that corn ethanol is is not delivering the greenhouse gas mitigation that has been you know quantified by various groups over the years right or wrong I, i'm not going to weigh in on one side or the other of, of that debate um but yeah it's it's been that's been tough and and i think you know there are people who who asked the, the question of kind of what's the opportunity cost? We use a lot of our corn to produce corn ethanol. Um, you know, if if we weren't doing that, sort of what would the world look like in this like alternative scenario? And, and I think a lot of those folks have like very different visions of, of what that would be. Um, so it's uh, the uh, it's it's just been a it's been a tricky, a tricky debate around the greenhouse gas footprint of corn ethanol what the world would look like if, if, you know, we had gone a different route, but I agree the scale is, is very large. Um, so if you, if you take those greenhouse gas numbers at, at face value, it's, it's offered a, a significant impact and maybe, you know, that story just has to be told differently. 
there's also the problem that electric cars are sexy and Elon Musk is a lightning rod and uh, corn ethanol is not sexy. That's not a very bio manufacturing policy way to look at it, but that's a problem. Yeah, so I that ties into very nicely into what I, I was going to say. I think there's a leadership issue and with good leadership and good messaging by the leadership, um, you know, there can be very positive or negative influences. And uh, the leadership has been lacking in this area for whatever reason. Uh, well, it, put it put it this way, um, you know, this is this is an area where if there's a transformational change, there's going to be winners and losers. And um, the losers, possible potential losers, are um, very well resourced uh, organizations, and uh, they're they're just not going to quit without a fight. Agreed. So for last question, I want to ask a question posed by Patrick Boyle about, are we thinking broadly enough about biology's yeah. role in carbon? As a field, should we be applying more effort to sequestration and recycling relative to the historical focus on bio-based replacements to petrochemicals? So there's two questions there. My answer to the first question, are we thinking broadly enough? No. And it ties into one of my, my favorite little taglines uh, when I'm speaking about um, bio-based process development and you have choices of how to um, develop certain areas. I like to say you win with biology. Biology is like software and uh, software is the way to win. Uh, tanks and pipes is brute force, uh, capital intensive, and and you, once you put that capital in the ground, you know it's sunk forever. But biology is like software; it'll always deliver more. You ask any company that's um, heavily vested in production of bioproducts using biology; they will tell you that as long as they keep investing in the biology, it'll keep in delivering improvements. And um, the second question, yes, I would say yes, until, until it's clear that opportunities aren't there because we need more sequestration and we need more recycling. So absolutely, yes. I, I, I got to say, if we had, if we had, um, if we had a, um, Biomanufacturing equivalent of NIH, um, that would be uh, really transformational in incentivizing very talented academicians to work in those areas instead of, you know, the next uh, cure for cancer. Maybe I should have said, in addition to the next cure for cancer. Thank you. I think there is an issue about not thinking broadly enough. There's two things. One, not every single solution is going to come from biology. And we showed that with the biofuels, from non-jet biofuels. It's not a solution that's going to come from biology. So being real clear about what is not going to be feasible from biology is the other half of that question or the, the flip side. And then the next bit is not everything's going to be solved with the current fad tools or the molecular biology like genetic modification. Not every biological problem has a GMO answer. Some of it is going to be using biology, but not controlling bio. Well, you can never control biology, but the practices, the methods we use in agriculture and bioremediation and waste digestion and expanding our use of biology. Remember that the greatest bioengineering effort in human history was agriculture. And that was mainly done without CRISPR. So there's a lot of arrangements, a lot of understanding, a lot of symbiosis we can do with biology that does not involve fermenters. And we definitely have to remember that and fund people who are even less sexy than us. Thank you, Sarah. Corinne, any 10 second thoughts left? Yes. <laughs> no, it's okay. We got a lot of questions. Uh, I'm sure I'll have other opportunities. 
Thank you so much, uh, esteemed panelists here. Really appreciate your candid thoughts. And thank you for everyone who participated and asked uh, very important, relevant questions. Um, so with that, I think we are, we have come to a close of the webinar.